Welcome everyone to our biotech and plant biology seminar here uh, in the IndieBio virtual world. Uh, my name is Julie Wolf. I'm part of the IndieBio team of our new New York office, and I'm very excited today to be hosting a wonderful uh, group of plant biologists turned entrepreneurs who are going to talk about their technology and their uh, businesses that they've started using their deep uh, technology knowledge and uh, their insight into plant biology. So thank you everyone for, for coming. Um, before I have all of our panelists give a very brief introduction, I myself have a very brief introduction. Uh, and I told all of the panelists, no slides. This is just a casual conversation, but I didn't follow my own rules. I have like five slides that I just want to uh, pop right up so that everyone is kind of oriented from the last Zoom meeting that you were just at. We're getting into, you know, an hour of awesome, uh, you know, plant startup world. Let's get everyone on the same page. So I will begin by sharing my screen uh, and just introduce today's topic. There we go. So welcome everyone to our um, biotech and plant biology session. We're extremely um, pleased to have uh, four panelists here to tell you about their journey into the world of startup. Uh, but before I introduce our panels, I want to briefly introduce IndieBio. Uh, since we are new on the East Coast, and I imagine that some of you in our audience um, who have not only come from hopefully New York, but since we're in this virtual world, are coming from you know, the rest of the United States and possibly the entire world. Um, so thank you all of you in the audience for spending this hour with us. Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about IndieBio. We are the world's leading biotech accelerator program um, in which we enable scientists to build radically transformative companies taking their cutting edge technology from the bench uh, where a basic research discovery has just been made to the market where the, an application and a commercialized product or service can be created. Uh, we do this through a four month accelerator program during which time we give the founding teams mentorship throughout that four month program and beyond lab space to work on de-risking the technology and $250,000 in capital in exchange for equity in the company. Now, uh, we have just opened up our new New York office uh, in 2020, as I mentioned at the top of the uh, hour. Uh, and we have run our first uh, cohort. We have just finished our very first program, which due to COVID was a virtual program. Normally, um, the founders are required to go either to the flagship San Francisco office or now to our New York office, depending on which program uh, in which you're participating. We are now accepting applications for our 2021 cohort. Uh, and we keep our URLs pretty simple here. So if you're interested in learning more or applying, please go to indiebio.co slash apply. Any questions about the application process, what the um, stipulations are for uh, what makes a good application, by all means, contact me. Uh, my name is Julie Wolf, as I mentioned, communications director here at IndieBio in New York. And of course, we have a number of other events, including our upcoming demo day at the end of October, October 27th and 28th. Uh, and you can find all the details uh, about our first cohort from New York and the 10th cohort from San Francisco uh, at indiebio.co slash events. All right, now I do want to talk about some of the amazing companies both within the IndieBio portfolio and um, without. We have some guests uh, from uh, really across the, uh, the um, large umbrella of biotech, as I like to call it. Uh, we have uh, in IndieBio funded 136 companies to date, um, and those can be in a number of different sectors. We fund companies that are in regenerative medicine, therapeutics, medical devices, industrial biotech, computational bio, neurotechnology, consumer biotech, uh, future food and agriculture. And today's guests have um, a number of companies that touch on many of these different sectors. All of these different sectors can, in fact, use various aspects of plant biology. Uh, and I wanted to highlight a few from the IndieBio portfolio that are not necessarily represented in today's panel. So let me just walk you through a couple of of cases that are not going to be talked about today before we get to what will be talked about today. Uh, and that includes using plant-based materials in order to make a plant-based meat, such as New Wave Foods does with shrimp um, and Notco does with, uh, they do this with a burger, they have a, a deal with Burger King in um, South America. They also make condiments such as mayo um, and drinks such as milk, which are normally from animals, but they make this entirely using 
uh, plant-based materials and AI in order to get the ingredients correct to, to most closely mimic what the original content is. Uh, we also can think of plants uh, when we think of biomaterials. Lingrove is a company that mimics, that they have a, a component that mimics the strength and the versatility of wood, such as you can see in this chair here. They also have a beautiful guitar uh, and, and many other uses for their flax-based uh, material. Uh, our, in our current cohort in San Francisco, Reasant is a company that is making organic uh, fertilizers, trying to get away from some of the um, fertilizers that are currently polluting our waterways and, and causing things such as large algal blooms. Uh, and then uh, Eleven Biomics is fighting specifically diseases that are um, endemic within the cannabis uh, plant uh, that is a growing sector of um, the economy as well. Uh, today, however, we are going to focus a little more, I think, on the genetic side, um, but I'm not going to introduce the companies. I will let uh, all of our founders do that themselves. I am pleased to have ha uh, Haven Baker, co-founder and chief business officer at Pairwise, William Pelton, uh, co-founder and CEO at Phytoform Labs, Luke Young, co-founder uh, and CEO of Agracy, and Jonathan Moiser, co-founder co and CEO at Kai Botanic. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing now and we will truly have a just kind of casual conversation. Um, and I think I, the only thing I had asked all of the panelists to do was to prepare just a brief uh, introduction to yourself, your scientific background, the company that you formed and, and when you formed and when you formed it, um, and maybe uh, what that company does and its, its growth stage at the moment. So if we could maybe do a round robin of that, then we'll dive right into some of the questions which you, are, our listeners, have submitted uh, and which you can continue to do by using that Q&A button down below. So first up, I would like to invite Haven Baker to introduce Pairwise. Uh, sure, so I can go first. Uh, so Haven here. Um, I, I grew up as a farm kid in Washington State, so I kind of had my roots in agriculture, multi-generation farming family, and um, it wasn't it, it wasn't that successful. So I, I kind of attribute that to be having my motivation to get so educated because I actually didn't want to be a farmer. Um, so anyway, um, I have a, a bachelor's in engineering and a PhD in chemistry. Um, I'm actually on my third startup, so. Um, I did a startup right out of undergraduate. I wasn't a founder, but I was number five when I got to join and watch a, some founders raise a whole bunch of money and have it not work and learn a whole bunch of really good lessons. Um, I started a company when I was uh, a graduate student and um, I think we did a little better that time, but again, it wasn't, it wasn't quite close enough. And I, and I, I got to the end of it and realized there wasn't quite a product market fit. And, um, and then I went and I worked in industry for um, nine years and um, when I was heavily involved in commercializing uh, some of the GMO um, products that came out in, in that food and ag space. And when CRISPR technology came around, we, I realized there was a real opportunity to, to do something that hadn't been done before. And so um, I co-founded Pairwise and, um, you know, I, I got my propaganda behind me as my uh, virtual wallpaper, but we're, we're trying to make better fruits and vegetables for consumers. Um, you know, I think of my kids and even myself, it's hard to eat healthy. And one of the reasons is there aren't snacks you know they say healthy on them but the fruits and vegetables we should eat are not um, um, are, are not the most convenient so the first idea was hey can we get cherries year-round and the second idea was uh, can we get rid of the pits then and so we're working on some new leafy greens and some new kinds of berries and uh, expect to bring our first product to market in a year um, stage a company so I founded it in 2017 we're at almost 100 employees now um, we're in uh, Durham North Carolina and um, we're raising a Series B right now. Wonderful, thank you so much, Haven. And I, I love the idea of cherries without pits since those are one of my favorite fruits. So uh, excellent, can't wait for that to actually be in the stores. Um, can I next invite William uh, to introduce um, his company, Phytoform Labs. Thank you, Julie, and uh, thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, my background, um, so I've always been a very passionate crop scientist. I, like Haven, I have some family background in farming, um, which didn't necessarily interest me uh, directly, but I really was fascinated by crops um, from a young age. So I went to, uh, to uh, university for my undergrad, studying botany, which was quite dry to be honest, quite a lot of taxonomy, so it's quite a lot of theoretical uh, evolutionary stuff. So after that, I was pretty determined to go and do something a little bit more applied. Uh, so I moved to Imperial College London, University of London, 
um, to do my master's and PhD. Uh, I ended up doing my PhD in potatoes, which I'm sure everyone's come across pretty much as hard as you can get. Um, and we were looking at like the fundamental me fundamental mechanisms behind dormancy in potatoes. Uh, at that time, genome editing obviously sort of was quite a cutting edge technology, and I was really lucky to be able to use that during my PhD. Uh, and together with my co-founder Nick, who was also doing his PhD in Imperial, we had a lot of time to chat and uh, you know put the world the world to rights. Um, and we thought, yeah, genome editing is an incredible technology. I think particularly transformative in agriculture. Um, and so we decided to see if we could develop something out of that. Um, so in like I think 2017, uh, we sort of started exploring the idea. Um, I mean, we technically formed the company then, but it was really didn't really exist to be honest. It's just the two of us. Um, and we sort of scoured the agricultural industry, asking questions about how genome editing would fit. And we kind of learned a few things. Um, so also genome editing is fantastic technology to transfer traits. But actually, you know, people are quite limited by the knowledge around the current traits. And people were looking for traits that can solve old, but also new problems like climate change in particular. Um, and you know, that was a real interest to us because agriculture has quite a bad uh, carbon footprint, sadly. Uh, and we also felt there was a lot that could be done with nutrition. Uh, so we took those ideas and we, we moved uh, from London to an agricultural research station just north of London called uh, Rothamsted. Um, it brags the oldest experiment in the world, it's been going for about 270 years. Um, and yeah, we started building our technology platform, which is basically formed of two components. Uh, so we have like a trait discovery component that combines machine learning with uh, large genetic data sets uh, to understand some of the mechanisms behind gene control. Uh, and then we have the second part, which is uh, like an impl implementation platform that leverages genome editing technology. Um, so we've uh, been dabbling in fruit and as well. Um, so at the moment we're looking at like uh, improving the harvestability of tomato to reduce waste. Uh, and also looking at storage and quality traits in potato because there's some pretty horrible uh, figures around how much waste is produced uh, after harvest. So we're looking at that. Um, and we, we're we sort of really quite early stage. Uh, we just finished our like pre, well, we finished our pre-seed uh, raise at the start of this year. Um, and so we'll be looking forward to the seed, seed raise uh, next year. Wonderful. Very interesting. And William, when you say storage, you mean things like, like rotting and the ability to um, have a longer shelf life, uh, uh, things like that, or do you mean disease resistance? No, like shelf life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, well, you also mentioned um, climate change, and I know that that's something that is close to Luke Young's heart. Uh, so I will next introduce Luke uh, to talk about agrisy and the non, I believe it's a non-veg, non-fruit uh, uh, crop that you are yeah, bringing you. to market. Yeah, thanks, Julia. Yeah, um, yeah no crop, uh, no veg uh, on this side at the moment, but certainly plan for the future. Um, yeah, so uh, you heard at the beginning that my name is Luke. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Agrisy. Um, we were actually in, in Dubai batch nine in San Francisco. Um, so we finished that in February this year. And since then, I've uh, tried to move as fast as possible, but COVID permitting. Um, best way to describe Agrisy is as an ocean agriculture company. Um, it's essentially we found a way for crops to be able to grow in the oceans in high salt water uh, conditions. And that can both exist in areas like the Mekong Delta, for example, where in Vietnam you're having an intrusion on what the water is normally irrigated with of this fresh water source and now is becoming highly saline. Um, this is a huge problem in Southeast Asia, but also begun to apply to many other areas as well. So Agrisy started about three years ago now, just coming up to it, actually we just had uh, our third birthday, if you will. And uh, it really starts as an idea. I'm a bit different to everyone else in this panel because I don't have a PhD. Um, I didn't start my PhD either. Um, so both my co-founder and I, we went to Durham University in the UK and we started doing our masters there. And during our masters, uh, we had two, well, we did separate projects and we both had some fantastic supervisors and really enjoyed the whole process. But through that, we kind of got disillusioned with academia. We wanted to try and find a different way to have a much larger impact with our work. Uh, and startups became the thing that came up every single time. 
And so I spent about six months after graduating just looking at every piece of literature I could. And this was all based around trying to address the largest problem I could find with the skills that I had and try and fix it. Um, and at that time, I looked at the UN Sustainable Development Goals and number two is no hunger. Um, and so advocacy really started on how do we fix no hunger? But then it's grown into, well, why does no hunger exist in the first place? Um, and what we found was that there are some incredible inefficiencies in the entire, entire agricultural supply chain, um, with the primary ones being land and water. Um, and so really, we tried to understand why, why those exist and do we actually need them? Are there alternatives? Uh, and the greatest alternative that we could find is what covers 70% of the world, which is salt water. Um, and so we then begun a two year really research period between us, my co-founder and I, of being able to understand how you can take a crop that can grow in soils on land and put it in the ocean. Um, and so that's what we're doing right now. Um, and we have a really exciting time ahead. Um, so we, in December this year, we'll start to set up our pilot plot in the Bahamas. Um, which is a terrible place to go in summer, um, but what can you do? And uh, start to grow actually crops there in the ocean. So we're keen to show everyone that uh, next year. Uh, it's very exciting um, to have your first uh, large trial like that. I'm very excited to see how that yeah. uh, progresses. <laughs> Uh, and finally, uh, last but not least, I'd like to introduce Jonathan Moiser of Kai Botanic. Um, could you please introduce your, yourself, your role, your company, as the others have done? Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm John Muser, and um, I've always been a, a tinker and kind of a gardener. Um, and I grew up during this time in the 80s and 90s where environmentalism was kind of really waking up and their concerns about climate change, but also in the context of the Gulf Wars. And so it started really becoming clear the impacts of fossil fuels. And, you know, I was always, uh, you know, I was looking at other movements, like everything from the Bolsheviks and Marcus, Marxists to environmentalism and uh, the anti-war movement. And I wasn't really uh, happy with how effective these movements have been. And so I started thinking about how if we could make something uh, it's incentivized because it's a lower price, people can't choose, they will choose to make the change rather than being influenced. And, you know, this is one reason I'm really excited to be part of IndieBio. I kind of think about the, the folks in IndieBio, kind of these Dharma capitalists who are influencing things by making a better choice available. I went on to, uh, to study plant biology because I saw biofuels as this kind of option, something that people will choose because we could make it cheaper or more available. And early on, I was looking at hydrogen from algae, from microalgae. And what I found is that, you know, we were trying to solve a basic biological problem for those of you that are plant biologists right now and thinking about starting startups. And there was also huge issues with the technology itself and the DOE was really interested, but it just didn't seem like something we could ever obviously turn into a startup, which is what I wanted to do. I really wanted to create a company that had that effectuated change. Later, we started getting more into, um, during my PhD, into producing oils and lipids from algae. And that had a different problem. It still solved this huge issue with fuel. But again, we weren't competing on a real level playing field of the true cost of, of, of the fuel itself because we could just drill it out of the ground. And so that really didn't seem like an opportunity that could become a real business, although there were plenty of businesses that were founded during that time. And we did start a, uh, a nonprofit called the Collective Biodiesel Conference, which went on for seven years, where we started making fuel from restaurant grease. And that was really exciting and a really fun time, but soon enough, it started getting, uh, became a commodity and became, you know, uh, reformed into uh, as an ingredient in traditional uh, uh, diesel production. Um, so I never really uh, founded a company during that time and I really was uh, eager to, to make a change. I did found a company uh, and it was an electronics company actually. It was called ALGI, Algae Light and Gas Instruments. And, and that had another problem uh, we saw this opportunity to create an instrument that could serve the algae industry by providing a tool that wasn't available, but the market was very small. Margins were really high, but it's a really small market. And, and the operational costs to run a company are pretty much the same. So that didn't really work out, although we did sell it and that was really great. Kai Botanic, I really think is informed by all of those things and we hope we'll actually have 
the massive impact that we've always and I've always had, you know, hoped to. I founded it with my co-founder who was a grad student at the Colorado School of Mines. And we were always thinking about, you know, what can we do? And the reason we founded Kai Botanic is that plants produce many, many compounds across a huge industry, uh, across flavors and fragrances, pigments, nutraceuticals, supplements, many things in addition to food that are products that are really high value, like over $100 per kilogram. So way more valuable than fuel. And we realized that we can produce plant products in a new way by growing plants as suspensions of cells. And by engineering these cells, we can produce the products that plants make. And specifically, we're interested in producing these ingredients that aren't just one chemical. There's many companies that exist already, companies like Ginkgo and Zymergen, focused on engineering microbes to make products, many of them that are in plants that plants produce. But we're trying to displace these ingredients that are very expensive and have low yield. They're from a small part of the plant because of geographical limitation or because they're from endangered plants. And we can do this with less fuel, less water, fertilizer runoff, uh, without any concerns about climate or location or season by producing these products in bioreactors uh, wherever we want. And the way that we're doing this is we're producing these plant cell cultures, but then we're applying modern uh, strain development technologies like robotics and high throughput screening to find those cell lines that are act acting in like those particular cells that are activated in those pathways that are normally in those small parts of plants. And so by doing this, we hope that we can have a solve a problem that has this altruistic social environmental impact, but also we're solving a business problem and we can leverage that to generate a, a solution to a huge industry doing it in a totally new way. Um, and at this point, we have completed a seed round uh, in March of this year. Uh, we're basically grinding right now to achieve our milestones and hope to do a series A in uh, early to mid next year. That's about it. Excellent, excellent introduction. Thank you, Jonathan. And con congratulations on closing uh, during COVID, which is no small feat. Um, so every uh, listening to all of you is it's very clear that all all four of you are very mission driven um, and approached forming a company and, and made a startup with the desire to add something better into the world. Um, but there's a difference between a science project and a company, right? As they have creating a product that you can put into the world. Uh, and I know William, you mentioned like talking to a bunch of customers, you had a, a technique and you were going around to see how could you use this technology. Um, I thought maybe more of our panelists could address, how did you know that you had an insight into something that would be a useful product, that there would be customers on the other end of that um, product. Uh, and I'm going to turn back to you, Haven, mostly because you're to my left, so it seems like a natural shift to me. Uh, I don't know if that's that way for everyone on the screen, but um, Haven, could you talk a little bit about how you knew that there was uh, a need for for more, I mean, ob obviously you mentioned your kids, but you know, um, your kids are not going to necessarily pay for the snacks that they eat. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I think that maybe I'll restate the question. Um, what you often see, in, in, and this was explained to me by Clayton Christensen at Harvard, but what you often see is a company invents a technology and they figure out how to make a product and then they go sell it. And one set of customers says, well, we don't know what to do with it. And so then you have to become your own distributor. And then the next set of customers says, well, we're not sure, right? It doesn't quite fit what we were doing. And so then, it, uh, then you have to go build the next stage. And, and, then, and then you're finally at retail. Most companies run out of money along the way. And so if what you're doing doesn't, makes sense through the chain. You either have to wait to reach your direct end customer or you have to invent your way through it, which is really complicated and expensive. And so I guess for, um, we, you know, I was working off really simple insights and the really simple insight for us is that 90% um, of grapes are seedless and 90% of mandarins are seedless. And we actually don't like seeds in our food. So when we think about creating um, foods that we all want to eat, getting rid of seeds is an important part. Now, We've expanded other products where new nutrition matters, but um, I think that was that was sort of the, the consumer insight. And then the technical insight is I'd seen a trial of, a, of a, a plant that fruited for three months. And when you made a genetic change, it now fruited for seven or eight months. And so I knew that this, that I had a sense that this, this uh, how long a plant could actually flower and fruit could actually be extended quite a way. So it was a combination of you know, so the, the, the technical observation as well as a uh, consumer sort of observation, if you will. 
Yeah, excellent. Uh, and so when you were doing your types of cu customer discovery, were you speaking mostly to consumers or were you working with people along that, that uh, distributive chain that you were talking about? So um, I'm, I'm, I, you know, the, the, the problem on along that line is the very best companies in the world at figuring out consumers are your CPG, you know, Kellogg, PepsiCo. And if you look at their new products, their new product success is only 10 or 15%. So if you go use their tools where you survey consumers and you figure out how to dice a market differently and assuming consumers your market, it, those are still not very successful tools. Um, so, you know, I, we can't afford a 15% um, success rate um, because we'd have to either work on 10 products or we'd have to keep starting over again as one didn't work. And, and so we were using inductive models, sort of what has already been successful and where can we pattern match to that? And that's sort of... And then later on, when we raised the money, we could afford to go do the surveys and said, hey, do consumers really match this inductive model? And, and so we got, we got sort of that traditional marketing proof later, but I, we, were, we were pattern matching more to previous success. Yeah, excellent uh, insight. Um, I'll turn, uh, William, you had mentioned some uh, discussions on uh, the cons consumer customer si side. Can you explain a little bit more in detail about those? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, you know, we, initially started out with this idea with very uh, little understanding of what we need to do to accomplish it. Uh, so we're really lucky at our university, um, there was this organization called Simply City who uh, was sort of holding, you know, workshops and programs to sort of help first time, first time entrepreneurs. Uh, and one of them was the Lean Launch Plan program, which is, uh, I think it's Steve Blank who sort of masterminded mm -hmm. it um, and it's great because it's about customer driven discovery so rather than building a product that you think will sell um, yourself you, you go out there and you say what do people need uh, and even that was a process in itself because we didn't really know who our customers were from the start right. um, so we, we uh, had some really bizarre conversations our, our initial product focus was on saffron uh, because we thought you know great worth its weight in gold, mm -hmm. um, fantastic plant to start on. Turns out it's quite a difficult one. The producing areas are, are not necessarily in areas which are easy to hold IP and you know, work with. Um, but we only learned that from, you know, bringing, bringing people all over, all over the world uh, to understand that. So yeah, I think our journey was, it was really important to understand that customer driven experience. Uh, and so far it's served us pretty well, <laughs> fingers crossed. Right. Well, you could have gone down the saffron path without talking to the customers, right? And then you Absolutely. wouldn't have known how difficult it would be. All right. Good, good insight. Thank you so much. Uh, Luke, same question for you. How did you know that this was something that you would be able to, uh, I guess, sell either to the farmers directly or um, along that distributive chain? Yeah, I, I can definitely empathize with William um, on trying to start with something very different. Um, I think we, we tried a few different crops before settling with rice. Um, but yeah, it's a fun journey and you'll go through it. Like if there are people here considering making a company, you will change your product or your process multiple times before you actually commercialize it, I'm sure. Um, for us, we, we knew the problem existed. Like the, because we approached the UN SDGs as like, okay, this is a set of problems that are preventing our um, world in general of actually reaching the sustainable vision. Um, and both Rory and I, my co-founder, um, actually see this vision, we, we try and figure out how that could become that, that vision we want to get to, this sustainable world that is um, where agriculture and many other systems as well um, are integrated into that environment um, rather than exploiting it and abusing it. Um, so for us, we knew that problem exists and we were like, okay, let's focus on building a system that can be more sustainable with the resources that we have. Um, the issue for us came with the ideal candidate initially would be rice, but rice is a very cheap um, grain when you're comparing it to other crops as well. Uh, so like, how do we do something good, um, be global at the same time, but be profitable? Because businesses do have to be profitable. You have to be able to grow and scale and do that quickly if you want to have the effect, um, especially when you're mission driven. Um, so for, for us, it was okay. We know that if we were scaled, if we were a huge company uh, and we had, say, 500 hectare farms up and down the coast um, of particular Southeast Asian countries, then we would be able to produce enough um, food and enough money to be able to uh, sustain that level of company. But how do we get there? 
there are different routes you can go through to that and you can look at investment routes you can look at even grants and government incentives um, or you can look at doing like a stepping stone and so for us we looked at is there an earlier market that we can reach um, and this was something we really got honed in uh, at uh, in Dubai actually um, in the first uh, couple of months um, we went through that process of going okay um, what we look at having are these ocean farms that are in place but at the moment about 27.3 billion is lost every year in agricultural productivity because of salt on land so where do those markets exist and how can we factor into those and help the actual farmers in place um, one thing we realized quite early on with that approach was even though we were farmer focused we had to make sure that the food that we were producing at the end was um, something that people recognize that the public could understand. Um, food has this knack of being very, very personal to us. We associate with particular brands, particular dishes in general, um, and making sure that you give the confidence to that end consumer um, of your product as you build it, even if you're looking at the upstream um, application is absolute importance to the whole process. Um, so for us, we started to look at those markets and the actual validation we received was when we started to get a lot of press. So over the past um, about six months, really, we've got um, a couple of Forbes articles out and then a wide article. But the amount of inbound interest that came from that, because people were like, this is a crazy idea, and it is, we, we fully recognize that, um, but someone's got to do it. So uh, we got all this inbound interest, and that was a validation for us. We started speaking with companies, um, and you know, a few would drop off, and that's okay. Um, and then you get the ones that really stuck out and wanted to do it. And from that led um, like a preliminary contract to have an actual ocean plot in Kenya, but then a seed licensing contract in Vietnam as well, which we're actually working to complete the final stages of now. Um, so for us, it was literally like people saying, if you can make this right now, then, then have it. And that came from that press attention. Um, so we cannot understate that enough, um, getting that, that voice out there, and even using the social media to do the same thing. That's excellent. And I want to talk a little bit about um, communicating and public perception of some of these products that you guys are making. But I want to give Jonathan um, a chance to answer about your your insight into you, the fact that you do that you had a product and something that people needed. Uh, perhaps that was a journey you went on or something that you did even before this forming your startup, um, given your your serial entrepreneur background, Jonathan. So yeah, actually, uh, during graduate school, my co-founder and I would keep a running list of ideas. And, um, and uh, afterwards, too, when I was in, um, in the uh, industrial biotech uh, world. And uh, when it came time to start a company, we uh, took part in the uh, NSF i program, which is kind of this lean startup model. Like William was saying, we went out and, and talked to people about our ideas. And early on, we had this idea to use uh, CRISPR gene editing on plant cell cultures to make improvements to plants in the field. So getting rid of anti-nutrients and, and toxins. And one of our earliest contracts was actually involved in disrupting a toxin that, that cotton makes. But what we found when we talked to people is that uh, a lot of companies saw that what we were doing was better, but they weren't necessarily willing to pay for it. They didn't see the value to the consumer that it was gonna trickle down. And, and also it looked like a long path to market wanted to get rid of the cyanides and uh, almonds or make a safer grapefruit, it was going to be decades, really, literally, before we could get the trees in the ground. So then we started thinking about the plant cells as the product and whether we could engineer plant cells in a faster way. And we started talking to people where we could solve, solution pro solve problems there. A uh, few people realized that aloe actually makes a toxin. It has to be processed out. But over thousands of years of uh, selection, there's a lot of other compounds in aloe that are beneficial that are lost during the processing. So we started talking to companies that sell aloe, that use aloe in their products, and we realized that if we could make this, this is actually an aloe culture, um, that doesn't have wow. the toxin but has the valuable compounds in it, that they'd pay twice as much. Um, and there was that market validation. We started talking to people about our other ideas for plant products. They were extremely excited. So then is, that's when we knew that we had legs behind this idea. In aloe, we didn't have to do the heavy engineering that we want to do later for, for instance, the production of a fragrance in a, in a plant cell, because mm -hmm. the plant cells that we're making already are producing the products that we need. Um, so this is a great first entry into the market. Oh, very interesting. I had no idea that uh, aloe produced a toxin. It's uh, actually a for me. 
Yeah, I mean, that's actually a problem for the market, actually, because it's hard to teach people something that they already ubiquitously use. So there's right. always challenges that come up. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, now, before I uh, get into the next set of questions, I want to invite all of you panelists to put um, perhaps your, I, I see there's a question in the, in the chat, but um, you can go ahead and just add if you want either your, your website for your company, your uh, LinkedIn profile, or your email address, should you feel comfortable um, with people potentially um, asking you further questions and extending the conversation. Um, now, I would like to move into some of the the I guess you could call it communications writ large, but that encompasses in my mind regulation. So you have to talk to the FDA and make sure that everything is, is regulated appropriately, as well as um, consumer acceptance, as, as Luke was saying about his, um, uh, his, his voice and his advocacy, like making sure that people are educated. And finally, that in my mind also encompasses talking to investors, right? Because Sometimes you have to educate investors who might not know that there's a toxin in aloe that uh, would be a benefit to, to produce without that. So um, perhaps uh, that's, that's a very large set of um, uh, types of communication. So maybe each of you can think about how communication um, in one of those aspects has affected the growth of your company and a lesson that you've learned along the way. So maybe take a second to think about something that you'd like to use as, as an example. Um, and this time I will turn first to Luke because you did use that social media as an example, but by all means, feel free to, you know, give whatever type of example you think is most pertinent. Um, or if you want to talk on the regulation side, that's fine too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can I get a quick review of that? Because just typing in my... Uh, uh, we are uh, Agracy at Instagram yeah, and Twitter. Oh yeah, just going to get a quick review of the question. Oh, yeah, because you were um, <laughs> typing instead of uh, listening to me blather on. Yeah, how has communication changed, um, has advanced your company in either regulations, in consumer acceptance, or in investor education? Choose one of those three that you think is really important for your company to have advanced in. Oh, that's a really, really good thing. Um, for us, uh, I can go down and say why one isn't relevant and why others are. Um, so for investor relations, we have a lot of amount of interest from IndieBio um, because we have that huge network um, and it's so exciting actually I have to say that IndieBio in New York is getting their first batch through. Um, there's some great, great companies this time around. Um, so yeah, it was really um, for us investors and being meeting investors wasn't the largest issue we saw. Um, with actually identifying the market, um, we saw LinkedIn as being a really good source for that. Um, mainly being able to post maybe articles we've had on there to actually do that. Um, and understanding our, our customers and, and the public as well. Um, communications for us ranging from being on social media and, and talking through that and having like live conversations um, and even panels like this is an ideal opportunity to get your conversation out there and then talk and just talk about it. Um, and also being able to um, discuss like an actual press article as well. I, the amount of inbound interest and emails we've had of just people being like, hey, I saw this article um, and I'm really interested in what you're doing in this country. And that's led to either a really good contact in the government or a corporation contact. And so for us, press has been a massive uh, enabler of actually um, getting customer inbound interest and securing that um, because it gives a really good primer to what your company stands for. Um, because we're in food, people do get behind your mission-driven statement. If you're producing a product, that's great and people love it, um, but people want to have an attachment, especially early on. Um, if you're an early stage company, um, people want to feel that kind of uh, emotional attachment to your company and push it forward. Um, the amount of investors I've spoken to now who've been like, yeah, we, like when we do this early stage of investing, we have like our tick box, tick box to like your economics, your unit economics, your general vision, um, you know, the actual technology um, checking. But at this stage, that's kind of all very much just a tick box. You know, people haven't maybe got to the point where they've got that solid product and it's on the market, so they haven't got those sales in. Um, really, they're believing in the people. And the people are then the, the vehicle for just um, exuding that, that vision and that belief in what you can do. Um, so establishing th that mission-driven statement and communicating that to the world is one of the best ways we've seen um, of getting both customers and the public support at the same time. 
Wonderful. And I imagine as a startup, you have limited bandwidth to do all of those things <laughs> at the same time. So knowing where yeah. to focus your energies is very important. Definitely. Um, I'll, I would yeah. just quickly say as well, um, people can be like very um, uh, careful about what they do post on social media uh, in the terms of like, is this okay? Is, is this perfect? And I think very quickly you learn, I'm, I'm sure everyone else will agree here, don't wait till it's perfect, just post it or just do the, the next prototype. It's never going to be perfect. Um, and it's just about getting to that next stage and getting that communication out there. Yeah, I, I would uh, suggest that that might be true, not just for social media, but also with just iterating and iterating on your, your products and yeah, things that are outside of tweets. Although yes, Twitter has a short memory, so just put it out there. <laughs> um, all right, I'll, I'll turn next to um, Jonathan. And Jonathan, would you like to share how you've um, communicated, maybe focusing more on either the regulatory side or the investor side um, since Luke did take um, press uh, and public relations. Um, sorry, regulatory or consumer uh, in terms of the customer? Uh, maybe more on the regulatory side. Uh, uh, no, that's uh, all right. Um, perhaps I phrased the question poorly. Uh, just trying to think about how, how did you get your path to market as someone um, in the consumer space, but, um, you know, producing something that is genetically modified in a particular way, right? Oh, well, that's, a, that's an easy, okay, so I can definitely talk about that. So, actually, um, we can do this in a non-GMO way, and that's really important for our cosmetics customers. Um, I absolutely hate the non-GMO project. Uh, with a passion, because I really feel that GMO, like genetic modification is technology, we can apply it in a great way. Um, however, for our business to business customers, it's extremely important to have that little label. Um, I don't know if we're ever going to pay for it, but our, our technology is kind of difficult. Is it really synthetic biology if what we're doing is we're accelerating artificial selection? So we're taking a trait, for instance, the higher production of a, of a pigment or a, a scent, and then we are uh, selecting through thousands and millions of iterations for those individuals that have that trait. And that's really the same thing that we've been doing through agriculture for millions of years, just doing it at a much more uh, high throughput and automated way uh, with the single cells rather than um, whole plants. Um, you know, so we can have the same number of individuals as every aloe farm in the world on a series of shakers. Um, so in a sense, you know, doing it in a non-GMO way, unfortunately, is very important for what we're doing. And then when we do gene editing, you can do it without introducing DNA. So when you do gene editing without actually introducing DNA, you just introduce the RNPs, the actual proteins. That's also considered non-GMO, at least in the United States. Um, my hope is that over time, needs of, you know, to uh, limit our impacts on the environment and, uh, and um, limit the impacts of climate change is gonna take precedence over irrational fears. Um, about a, t a particular technology, which can be applied in a negative way. Um, but um, in terms of the investors, you know, it's really our milestones drive our relationships. And um, for us, uh, we have a database, we call a Kybase, of all the different plant products that we see problems with and that we can improve. Then that database with all the metadata gets funneled down to those which are the highest priority and from those, that actually directs us to the marketplace and those uh, key players in the marketplace. Then we look through our network and find those in our network that can access and provide those introductions. And luckily, like Luke said, um, the, uh, those in the Indie Bio Network and those that they've connected with us, as well as people I know through industrial biotech have been really helpful um, in uh, accessing those individual markets related to those particular products. Um, I but see, as I a business-to-business -business company, we don't have to necessarily look for a broad uh, customer uh, interactions as much. I see. As long as you can put that, that little stamp um, on there, then people are happy that it is not GMO. I don't think we'll ever pay for it. I, yeah. I just don't think I can stomach it uh, just to support that. Because I think it's actually doing more harm than good. I really do. 
Well, uh, that may be something that needs to change as a culture. And so part of the, the communication strategy of people in, in this panel may be part of what helps to move that forward. Now, you mentioned that you're business to business. Um, let's just do a quick like reaction shot. Can you guys, do you guys know where the thumbs up is? Uh, oh, we don't have it here. Maybe just give me a like physical thumbs up. If you are a B2B business, I'm curious. One of the questions that was submitted here is whether there's a B2C company. I think everyone here is B2B. Is that correct? Yes, thumbs up. No, so yeah. um, to we'll answer, be to we're B2C, we will be. You are to B2C, okay, great. Um, and so I would imagine that customer um, education is particularly uh, important, Haven. Can you talk about how you decided um, to go that route and um, what consumer education has been on your end? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're trying to bring new fruits and vegetables to the market. We're using technology to do that. And the channel doesn't explain that very well. The channel is good at selling the same thing every day in and out. And so, and also if you want to brand it and get some sort of premium, um, if it's a better product and you, you, you know, you end up branding and that ends up being differentiation. I think that um, for us, there's a clear distinction that, you know, you're communicating the public through, you know, your website, your press releases and things like that. And the mission is a good reason to believe, but you don't want to communicate the channel until about 18 months before you're ready to launch the product. Otherwise, you're that company that talked about it five years ago and never delivered it. So you actually have to have different messages. Um, and, and I think the mission plays an important role on, on why, um, why what we're doing as a company or any company is doing is important for society, important for our, uh, for our customers. Excellent, excellent. Now a question more on the technical um, de-risking. Uh, does the, the longer replicative time or generation time um, play a role in de-risking or the major milestones that your companies have had to, to reach? How does that um, affect uh, the growth of the company and the de-risking milestones? This is a kind of a strange question, um, but it was one of the submitted questions. So I'm curious if anyone has uh, insights into this. Now, I would guess that Jonathan, you've kind of gotten out of having to use a generation time by using these plant cell cultures, is that uh, correct? Actually, it's it's very very challenging. So um, we start with cells that are undifferentiated on a, a petri dish. They grow very slowly, and then we have to take those and put them into a culture and identify the correct culture conditions. And when the cells are growing as a plant, you know, taking weeks to divide, it's very slow early on. The idea is is that ultimately we can get cells like these that divide in days rather than weeks and months. Um, but getting there has to take a long time and it's really challenging um, to convince investors to help to understand, even in the biotechnology field where people are used to growing yeast and bacteria um, that, that, okay, you know, these are going to be longer generation times. Also, the economics, we're doing the modeling, don't apply. We can't just take uh, off the shelf, so to speak, other people's models or what's it, what it's going to cost to make our products. So we've had to build that from scratch and that's been very time consuming and taken a lot of energy um, and something to consider uh, when you're starting a plant uh, biotechnology business. Even when they're cells. Growing even, even when they're cells. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Any other in insights? Yeah, Luke, please. Yeah, um, I think for us, like just as John said, the, the process of trying to figure out that like generation time and communicate that to investors was definitely an obstacle. Um, like if you tell someone you can get a product out in like four months or five months, they're like, well, that's like way too long. And in fact, in the plant biology world, that's like quick. Like, that's, you know, people are like, hey, that's awesome. Good job. Um, and getting people to understand that is, is a really critical point as well. Um, for us, like some of the really good ways what we've found of like essentially skipping out our own de-risking steps that we planned on doing is being able to work with um, existing experts and partners and, and companies have already entered this space. Um, in the biology side, we're quite comfortable with like our approach and how we're doing it. And so it's really just a case of time and growth for the actual plants themselves. Um, in the mechanical side, because we are putting these mechanical floating um, platforms in the ocean, it's a lot of questions around um, how those are in place and like how do they interact with the environment. Um, and so we started looking at different groups of like aquaculture. It's the most um, similar project and, and industry to what we're doing. Um, and we were lucky enough to get invited to a, a summit held by RPE, which is like the research arm of um, US government. 
Uh, and those groups, there was about 12 of them, um, and they all had spent maybe anywhere between like five and 30 years on different projects associated with aquaculture, um, in particular in like seaweed farming as well. And so they'd experienced all these problems 30 years before we were about to. Um, and they've had all these different solutions and really a range of ones depending on what you wanted to do. And so being able to get into that kind of community and really if you're saying, you know, you want to um, like empower a particular economy or, or develop a particular area using a technology or just simply you love science and you want to push it further, people will help you um, and people will try and push you along a bit. Um, and so for us, it was being able to help out um, ourselves by, uh, by talking to these guys and saying, being quite open about what we're doing and saying, you look, we don't know this and, and that's okay, but could you say something and, and give us some advice on how to, to tackle and approach it? Um, and that has taken a year at least um, from our development cycle. Working with your strategic partners uh, in, yeah. who can help yeah. along the research, that's great. Yeah, and being quite open about you know where what obstacles you are facing. Um, it's quite common to be like, we have this obstacle, but it's gonna be fine. Uh, we'll figure it out or we have plans for it. And sometimes saying you don't have a plan can be more powerful, more, more beneficial for you. Um, if people don't think you're just making it up as you go along. Mm. Excellent, thank you. Now, uh, there's a question in here about the startups as GMO playing a role in Europe. And I, I think this is particularly uh, a good question since uh, I believe that William and Haven are both using genetic modification of um, crops. And uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, I just heard genome editing in your um, talks, but uh, William, you're in England and Haven, you're in the US. And I wonder if that affects what market you think that you'll be moving into or the technology. Uh, how, how, I guess, how do the different regulatory um, stipulations or regulations of countries play a role into where you see your product going into market? Uh, William, if you'd like to kick it off. Yeah, sure. Um, that is a great question. Uh, when we started this journey, uh, the European Court of Justice hadn't even made a decision on how genome edited crops should be regulated. So the kind of distinction yeah. we make is that GMOs you introduce like foreign DNA, whereas genome editing, you sort of make uh, deletions or change single base pairs rather than introducing something from, from um, another species or another organism. Uh, and then unfortunately, uh, in July 2018, they decided that all genome edited all biotechnologies like genome editing will be regulated in the same fashion, which effectively cuts off Europe um, from that sort of biotechnology, which, you know, it, it, it's still up for debate um, whether that was the right decision. I, I'm, you know, pretty biased, so obviously I think that it's not the greatest decision ever made. And I think Europe is going to suffer as a result um, because we've been losing talent to, you know, companies like all of, all of you guys in the US, uh, hand over fist, sadly. Um, so yeah, and, and what's crazy as well is, you know, we're, we're developing genome edited crops for the US uh, and basically all the other markets that have a, you know, well-defined regulatory system for these sorts of crops, which is pretty much most other places. I think, you know, realistically, New Zealand and Europe are like the places that have just said flat out no. Um, so, uh, and yeah, and it's crazy the fact that in the UK, we can produce this genome edited plant completely not allowed, not allowed to take it outside our building flight over to the US and it's completely fine. Um, no regulatory uh, problems whatsoever, which, uh, you know, seems kind of bizarre. Um, so it's been really important in how we develop our strategy. We had to pivot very early on from our talks with um, European uh, uh, plant breeders uh, who immediately said, nah, not interested, yeah. too risky, um, and start to look further afield to the US being you know, a great market starting um, because people tend to be more innovative and more accepting. But I don't know. Yeah, we'll have to see how Europe continues. There is some hope here, some hope that the ECJ will potentially change their mind. We'll see. I know, uh, I know some countries like France, there are lobby groups there who are not just saying ban GMOs, but ban all plants bred using mutational methods like radiation and chemicals, which is basically most plants we eat now. Uh, so I don't know what that would look like, but potentially they'd just go back in time. Um, 
have to get rid of grapefruit, right? Yeah. <laughs> They're just eating a lot of seeds and uh, a lot of very weird and small plants. Um, but yeah, I know there's hope in the UK as well. Um, there's an agricultural bill currently going through, which is calling for uh, less relaxed restrictions in the UK as we leave Europe. Um, so yeah, we'll have to see. An interesting time to be uh, doing this sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, at Haven, how have you considered regulations within the U.S. Uh, as you move forward? Yeah, just just a real quick clarification. All foods are regulated. So to say something's regulated or not regulated is probably that not is quite, an excellent quite right. Excellent point. Yes. So, that, so it's really about whether it's considered GMO or not. And so, Correct. if you use gene editing tools and you create a plant that could have gotten there through natural breeding processes, or you know, even if it had taken a thousand years. Um, then it's considered non-GM. I mean, you didn't bring any foreign DNA in. You could have got there the conventional breeding. And, and, you know, the U.S. and most of South America and Australia and Japan have settled on that as, as this just a new breeding technology. Um, I, I think China's still a question mark. And, of course, Europe's firmly negative. And, and we view it that maybe as a positive first. Um, you know, we're going to get a lot less competition. There's quite a few breeding companies in Europe. Europe's been strong and they're just not, they're just not going to participate in the competition. They'll get further and further behind. So it kind of leaves the, the space wide open, which is kind of fun. But I think relative to the business model, um, what that means is if you're in a, working in a crop that's globally traded, like corn or soy, you know, that goes all over these borders and then you can't take a trait, a gene added trait to market, even if it's non-GMO in the U.S., without those regulatory approvals in Europe. And that creates quite a bit of expense and slows stuff down. And so, you know, you, we're looking at business models that are country or maybe continent specific. So that, um, so you can focus on one market. And I, I think you're gonna see this all over. You'll see that some of this stuff starting to happen in Australia, certainly Argentina, and, and we're not the only ones working out. There's a number of folks working in America. We're, we're starting with products for our own markets and um, they'll, they'll grow if people like them. That sounds like a good strategy, especially if you're in a large country like the U.S., where hopefully uh, you can come to bring all well, of that. Then that's why fresh for us, fresh produce makes sense because fresh stuff isn't exported. Um, right. So you you know very much, and so it's relatively easy, easy to, um, to, to to watch that. Yeah, excellent point. All right, so we're coming up at the top of the hour, um, and I don't know if I'm going to get to all of the questions and answers, which are. Um, in our Q&A, but I'd like to thank our audience again for the questions that you've submitted both with registration and with uh, during the, the conversation. Uh, real quick, kind of a fun question. Um, have you guys tasted the products that you are making? I think you guys may have seen this. Uh, maybe another like um, thumbs up or you want to answer real quick. I see you unmuted, Haven. Have you tried your? Yeah, your... so we're, we have leafy greens um, that, are, that look like lettuce, but have nutrition of kale. In the, in the wild, they're very, very pungent, and we got rid of the pungency. So yeah, they taste just great. And then we, we've had selections of the berries we're working on. We haven't had edited berries yet. We, ha uh, we won't have them till spring. So yes on leafy greens, almost on berries, and we won't have a pitless cherry till 23. So yeah. 2023, all right. Anyone else uh, try the goods, or perhaps you're still on, iterating on the, the final product. So uh, um, that fruit salad or the uh, rice curry will have to wait. Um, great. I'm just going to end with one question and do another round robin. I think that this will be really valuable for you to give insight that you would have given to yourself, right? What, what have you learned along the journey that you would tell yourself before starting your company, um, assuming you would still start the company, but you wish you had known? Uh, and I'm going to pass it over to Jonathan um, to kick us off. Like, what do you wish you know, in, the, in this iteration of your company, uh, of your life as an entrepreneur, you would have known before starting Kai Botanic? Uh, I don't know, COVID was coming and I need to answer. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> we all wish we had a crystal ball for that one. Um, I know. Shoot, I don't know. I, uh, I, I'm sorry, we'll give you, we'll give you a t uh, 10 seconds here. Okay, yeah, maybe circle back. <laughs> sure, no problem. Luke. Yeah, um, for us, it was go for a crop with a shorter generation time. Um, we didn't want to go through, convince people that long generation times are a, a better or a, just a necessity um, for larger markets. Um, and we went for rice initially, which takes four months to grow. And Indie Bio happens to be a four month program. Um, so there was no room to mess up whatsoever. Uh, so getting something that can grow in a month rather than four months is uh, definitely beneficial. 
All right, good, good uh, piece of advice there. Uh, William, what would you tell yourself pre um, Phytoform Labs like that you wish you had known and been prepared for? And yes, I think COVID is actually yeah. probably the most valid and ubiquitous answer among the panelists, but maybe something a little more specific. Um, I would say, so I mean, now we're very happy with like the advisory team that we've put together, but I would have said when starting out, I should have, yeah, really paid more attention to that and really developed uh, relationships by faster uh, because uh, perhaps we were a bit late and when pushed comes to shove, those sort of advisory positions are just like, they're, they're so important. They are like, especially as first time entrepreneur, um, yeah, pretty terrible at it. So having people who are a little bit more, uh, you know, who understand the whole concept a bit better is, is, is really important, um, including, uh, I want to give a big shout out to Stephen Chambers of Indie uh, Bio, because he was the guy who took me through Lean Launchpad, which I mentioned earlier. He was at Sin um, uh, Simbi City, correct? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, so he was incredibly patient, uh, considering how many mistakes we made daily. So yeah, those sorts of people are just yeah, gold dust. Excellent, excellent piece of advice uh, to find good advisors. Uh, and Haven. Yeah, real, I think the, the most unexpected benefit of a startup is getting to work with a great team. And I wish I'd have known that early. It's way more fun. I'd, if I'd known this as much fun, I would have done earlier. So the, the, the unique position of being able to hire the team around you and have great people makes it fun. And it'll be fun whether it works or doesn't work. I mean, obviously, success is important. But I think when you get all done with it, and I'm, now that I've been through a couple of these, that it's the great relationships you form and the teams you have that really are the rewarding experience as much as anything else. Uh, sounds that's excellent piece of advice uh, and circling back Jonathan you can close this out with your advice for early stage entrepreneurs yeah I think the, the thing is you want to start something that has this huge dream you know that you're going to do this revolutionary change but at the same time you have to get a foot in reality where you have these timelines you, you're spending money so it's really really important uh, every day I have to check in that we're staying on track to meet our milestones, to get to the next hurdle. Um, so the baby steps towards uh, the ultimate bigger goal and making sure that we're on track uh, so we're gonna get there. Um, and that that's uh, something that we have to, um, uh, it's a constant work in progress. Yeah, I would imagine quite a balancing act of that pie in the sky, like big cha world changing technology, but also like the day-to-day -day progress uh, that you need to just keep on track of, right? How are we going to sell this and when and to who, you know? Yeah. What do they want? All that it has is, it needs to be in the forefront of your mind at all times. All right. Well, we've gone two minutes past and I would like to thank all of you, Jonathan, Luke, Haven, William. This has been really fun for me. I hope that you've enjoyed sharing a little bit of your experience with our early stage entrepreneurs. Um, everyone who's attending, thank you very much. Um, we will be publishing this so you can watch it again or if you came late, be able to catch the beginning. Thanks again, everyone, um, and have a great rest of your day. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks thank for coming, Australia. Take care. Okay,